Another thing we all know Pat Croce for is his time with the Philadelphia 76ers. Now when he took over the team, they were actually last place in the league, but he had the magic touch and ended up having one of the greatest turnaround stories in NBA history. Pat, before we went to break, you were saying how you can't stand Kobe and Shaq, right? <laughs> <laughs> Kiddingly, although I do know them both, and they're both great guys, but not when you're competing against them. Mm -hmm. And that was in the finals of 2001. We won the first game. Allen Iverson, who was my first-round draft pick when I first took over the team, was fabulous. He didn't, believe, he didn't belong in that court against these guys. Cause it, was, it was like David versus Goliath. <laughs> but then they took us to the next four, and it was just a fabulous run. But I should tell you, Jenna, like any successful business or endeavor, it's the people that surround you. I can't play basketball, mm -hmm. but I had Allen Iverson when I was lucky enough to win that lottery in 1996. Mm -hmm. Larry Brown, great coach. And then the pieces, like any team, on or off the court, and just letting them, providing an environment for excellence. And that was my goal. Motivate him, keeping him, you know, chastise him. When Allen missed practice, I was the one that had to sit him out. The coach wouldn't touch him. I'm the one that had to make him stay home because mm -hmm. the press is going to be all over you. But you had to, right? You mm -hmm. have to discipline. You have to congratulate. Like anything in, in everyday life, mm -hmm. you want to pat him on the back or kick him in the butt. <laughs> so you wanted to kick him in the butt. And oh, many times. <laughs> but I wanted to pat him on the back during that run for the finals. Okay. Now, when you took over the team, Pat, you were saying that you had to keep going back to the guy. He didn't want to give you the team at first. No, like anything else, nothing's ever easy, Jenna. Mm -hmm. When I first told him that, sell the team to me, no. But he didn't, well, he said, not, not yet. When I want to sell, I'll sell, I won't want to sell yet. And I, all I heard was yet. I didn't hear no. And when I hear no, the salesperson in me interprets it as no, not yet. <laughs> and I just keep coming back mm -hmm. and coming back. And I really paralyzed his resistance with my persistence. And I believe that anyone who's taking action on their passion in your viewing audience should continue to go after it. And if you get a no or a negative, find out I must not have asked the right question. Do more homework mm -hmm. and get more due diligence and more insight, more evidence, and go back again and again and again, just like you're here. You didn't just knock on a door and they said, okay, Jenny, you can have a show. No, people get rejections, but most people, oh, they cry and they walk away and they think, oh, my goals and dreams are not going to happen. No, pick it up learn and go at it again i love that attitude and it is so so true how many times did you go back to him pat well i can only tell you this that in the press conference when it announced it on april 19 1996 the media says harold why'd you finally decide to sell the team he looked down the dais and pointed to me and said because pat croce called me 50 times <laughs> so That's good. 49 times he said no <laughs> but that 50 time he got it. And now, didn't people say you were crazy, too, for taking over a team that was in the last place? No, they, they, they why? Why would you want to do that? The team always sucked. Mm -hmm. they, weren't, they weren't even good. They didn't even sell out when Dr. J was in the championship round in 83. Mm -hmm. I said, whoa, 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 stop. Watch. Because if you infuse energy and team esprit and you get everyone involved in your dream and you communicate in such a way that they feel part of ownership of your special things can happen. Mm -hmm. We only had less than 4,000 season ticket holders when I took over the team in 96. By 2001, there was 40,000 waiting to buy a ticket. No, mm -hmm. forget about it. It was wow. fabulous. You ignited the passion. Yes, I did, <laughs> because I was passionate about this. Mm -hmm. See, I can only do what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate mm -hmm. about Key West, and that's mm -hmm. why I developed the Rum Barrel, mm -hmm. Island Dogs Bar, Green Parrot, mm -hmm. Charlie Max. These are these are institutions down in Key West here that I'm passionate about making great memories for people who come to Key West so that when they leave, they say, wow, we had a fabulous time. We did Fury and Water Sports, and we went to Island Dogs and had this great Key Lime Martini. Mm -hmm. You, you want to attack people, right? You want to mm -hmm. attack them in a way where they touch on their emotions. Mm -hmm. So we it makes memories. You do that. You definitely do that. Now, how did you get to Key West? And you were doing the 76ers up in Philadelphia. Where in the world did Key West come into play? Oh, that's a great question, Jen. It was about 25 years ago. I brought my son down there. I was supposed to. I took my daughter. I had to do something for Disney, a video out in Anaheim. And so I took her with me. She was 10 years old at the time. Mm -hmm. It was with Sport Goofy. I was really into fitness at the time. And so I promised my eight-year-old son, Michael, we would do something. He wanted to go ski, and I never skied. I never had any money during the winter time. And then once I started making it, I had flyers and sixers and then sports medicine centers. So we were going to go skiing, but it was raining mm -hmm. in the Pocono Mountains. So I said, let's go to Key West, because I was always in fact, fascinated with Jimmy Buffett. I loved mm -hmm. his music, even 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. 
So we came down with a buddy of mine, Joe Masters, who had been here before. And damn if we didn't see Jimmy Buffett and get a <laughs> picture with him. But that, I fell in love with the eccentricity and the eclectic group of people and the water. And the, it's just such a fun place. Mm -hmm. I've been coming ever since. And then about you know, 12 years ago, I bought a home down here. Okay. So it was that trip. Yes. That was supposed to be a ski trip. Yeah, how about that? Well yeah. said. <laughs> that sold you on Key West. That's right. When did the first business come about, Pat? In Key West? Mm -hmm. I started at the Pirate Museum here. It's mm -hmm. called Pirate Soul. And again, Jenna, this was poor due diligence on my part. I used more prejudicial evidence. I loved Key West, and I thought a Pirate Museum in Key West where I have a home would be fabulous. But it was wrong because people come here for the water activities. They come here for the bars and the mm -hmm. partying and the camaraderie. If rainy day, they might come in the museum. So that's why I moved the entire museum to St. Augustine, where it's doing fabulous because Heritage Tourism works there. Mm -hmm. Here, it's the, and so next door to it, there was, the rum, there was a bar there. It was ugly. So I renovated it and built the rum barrel. Oh. And then across the street, mm -hmm. Dave Thibault, myself, we, and my, my son, we bought the Island Dogs Bar. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so then we went, I was lucky enough to do it with John Bagnoni, the Green Parrot, and keep that tradition going. Mm -hmm. And then next door, Charlie Max. Mm -hmm. oh, and these are all fabulous restaurants and bars that you have just mentioned. We're going to take a quick break right now, but I'm going to have you talk more about your fascination with pirates when we return Super. from these messages. Arr. Stay with us. <laughs>